Good evening, everybody. Welcome. Thank you so much for coming here to the Yale Center Beijing. My name is Lena, and I am a graduate of Yale University and the Yale School of Public Health. So this program is very near and dear to my heart because he, our guest today is Stan Vermond, who is the former dean of the Yale School of Public Health and who's going to teach us a lot about a very, very important topic today. So a little bit about our center here. Uh, basically, the center is Yale University's home in China, and we have been here for almost 10 years, uh, since 2014, and this is Yale's only university-wide center representing all 15 schools of Yale. So it's the only center outside of the U.S., uh, and we happen to be in the wonderful uh, Beijing. So. Um, Today, as you know, we're going to talk about PFAS and uh, microplastic or forever chemicals. Um, Professor Vermond is actually a, a wonderful researcher, pediatrician, epidemiologist, and a global health star who has projects all over the world, um, especially focused on low and middle income countries. And in places like Zambia and Mozambique, Nigeria, China, on topics ranging from HIV um, to COVID. So um, today we are going to talk about PFAS, as, as you have read. And this is a very important topic for everyone, um, mainly because we use these objects, these chemicals uh, in our everyday lives. and. Now we know that they also cause a lot of issues and health concerns, especially in young children. So uh, I'm very excited, and I hope this is going to be a wonderful discussion. Um, this event is actually uh, co-hosted with the Yale Health Healthcare Club of China and the Yale Club of Beijing. And to introduce the he Yale Health Healthcare Club, of China is Selena Zhang. So I'll let her say a few words and then we'll go on to the discussion. Thank you. Um, thank you. Uh, thanks the uh, Yale Center Beijing for this opportunity to give us the uh, chance to co-host the event. Uh, we are very honored to be here and actually um, we, uh, since the establishment of our club, we have been a long-term friend with Yale Center Beijing. And also uh, today, it's our honor to have Stan here. We have also established long-term relationship with Yale, School, uh, Yale Public School of Health, and especially under the uh, guidance and the support with Dr. Stan Vermont, we have grown very fast in China. And we have uh, done so many events together. Um, so um, yeah, we are very happy to be here today. And we will leave the precious time to Stan. Thank you, Lena. Thank you, Selena. It's a pleasure to be back uh, at uh, Yale Center Beijing and in China. This is my third trip to China this year in 2023. And uh, it's a great pleasure, each and every one of them. I've, I'm recovering from a bit of a, uh, a cold and sore throat and COVID negative multiple times. Uh, but, uh, but if I don't sound my, quite myself, that's why. Um, so uh, let's go ahead and, um, and um, sort of objectives of this presentation. Um, I'd like to tell you about Forever Chemicals. Um, give some plausible mechanisms for human health impacts, review PFAS, but I also thought uh, other micro constituents would be of interest to you. They're not, strictly speaking, forever chemicals, but they, they have long-term uh, half-lives in, in nature, and they're kind of related, you might say. And a little bit of, um, I couldn't be a pediatrician without mentioning the kids. So we're all familiar with macro constituents. These are natural and man-made substances in the environment that we can see. Um, and uh, visible products of the earth, buildings, vehicles, equipment, but also waste, plastics, pollution, things that we can see. 
so macro constituents can be beautiful like the Petronas Towers of, of Kuala Lumpur uh, or useful like this, this sea of bicycles that I saw in Chongping uh, when I was there this summer. Uh, uh, but it can also be ugly like the great Pacific garbage patch. Uh, it, they say patch singular, but it's actually two of them, two areas of garbage, mostly plastics, that are floating over vast areas of the Pacific Ocean. Here, the west, oops, I, I didn't mean to do that. Here, here, the western garbage patch off of, of, of um, uh, Japan, <clears throat> and the eastern garbage patch between, uh, sort of, off of Baja, California. And you have no idea how big these patches are. If you combine them, they're about this, they're almost as big as uh, uh, the, the United States. So because of the eddies of the, uh, of the uh, fluid of the um, waters, what happened? Oh, there it is. Because they, they're, sort of, they, they're sort of just circling, circling, circling. And we add to them every day with our pollution that goes into the ocean. So these are the macro constituents, things we can see, things we know are there. But micro constituents, these are um, things like drugs. Drugs we take as humans, drugs that we give to our animals. Um, only a fraction of drugs are metabolized by our bodies. The rest gets excreted in our urine, sometimes our feces. And a lot of drugs are thrown away, discarded. Then we have food supplements. Some people call them nutraceuticals, you know, n nutrition supplements like vitamins and others, the things you buy at the health food store. And uh, caffeine, nicotine, fragrances, pet products and supplements, all of these uh, can end up in the environment. Uh, things we use on our bodies like sunscreen agents or uh, lotions, shampoos, soaps, deodorants, toothpaste, cosmetics. We don't swallow our toothpaste, we use it and then we spit it out, right? So when it's spit it out, it gets in the water supply. A fire retardants, I'll be telling you about those in a little while. Uh, polybrominated diphenyl ethers. Sometimes they're called penta, octa, and deca, and they're PBDEs, try to say that five times fast. PBDEs, PBDEs, I can't do it. And organophosphate substitutions uh, for these. And uh, pesticides, which are bactericides, herbicides, fungicides, insecticides, all sorts of chemicals that we put on our plants to protect them from bacteria, fun, uh, um, 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 plant, plant killing, uh, you know, uh, killing, killing weeds, um, um, fungi and insects. And then there are, of course, the industrial chemicals. And industry requires a lot of chemicals to make the products that we use. And some of the chemicals are integrated into the product itself. And that ends up in the environment when you discard the product. Others of them are side products of the manufacturing. And they get discarded into the environment more or less right away. And some of them accidentally get in. For example, you can have a lubricant on machinery. But, but as the machinery is running, the lubricant ends up in the environment, either aerosolized or it ends up uh, being washed when they wash the, the uh, machinery or it leach out, le leaches out and it's cleaned up by the cleaning crew. But it ends up in the uh, environment. And some of these industrial chemicals are these forever chemicals that we're talking about. And we have bisphenol A, uh, BPA, phthalates, and these relatives of PFAS, PFOS, and PFA. So these are all things in common use. Now, this is the emphasis of today's discourse, which is the forever chemicals, the PFAS. And just to tell you what a PFAS is, there's how many carb carbons here? Two, four, six, eight. Eight carbons. And this eight carbon backbone 
And in this case, fluorines on the edges and an oxygen and hydrogen, you can have different moieties with different chemicals. But this eight carbon um, backbone, ha Mother Nature didn't create this, okay? Mother Nature doesn't have eight carbon backbones. This is human created. And because of the um, novelty dating from the 1940s, we don't have a million years of coevolution with these products and um, bacteria that break them down. So because of this uh, lack of natural products that have adapted to eat this product, there is nothing that breaks it down. So it goes in the environment, stays in the environment, and we call it a forever chemical because as far as we know, it's forever. There is no breakdown product. We're, we're unaware of anything that will break this down in nature. So it will simply be recycled within nature and uh, picked up by other organisms, including ourselves. Now, these were transformative discoveries that changed manufacturing and product development. Um, and many products were as a consequence of these chemicals. So they were popular. People said they were a breakthrough. They were seen as a good thing. And uh, we call them per and polyfluoroalkyl substances. So they were used to make water, grease, and stain repellent clothing. So when I clumsily spill my coffee on my pants, I'm, I'm dreading what the result will be when I go get some water because maybe I have stain resistant pants and the next thing you know it's clean. Maybe my sofa is stain resistant, I clean it with water, it's clean. It's coffee, it should be brown, oh it's fine. So they're popular items, right? You like it when it's stain resistant. And if you have water resistant clothing and you're going hiking or you're in a job where you're constantly being exposed to rain, an outdoor job, and grease uh, 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 repellent uh, coatings. No, cook, no stick cookware. You make your egg and you just tip the pan and there it is on your plate instead of scraping it off. Now the US military said this year that forever chemicals are essentially for, uh, essential for military preparedness because there were congresspersons saying we should ban PFAS use to the U.S. government. And the military people came in and said, no, our torpedoes work better, our missiles work better with these substances. So they are powerful forces in industry, in government, that do not want to get rid of PFAS. But this is what worries us in public health, persistent in the body and the environment at least for decades and maybe for hundreds of years, maybe thousands of years. We don't know yet because it's only been around since the late 1940s. So we know they don't degrade in 80 years, that we know. And based on the uh, chemist's judgment, they probably won't degrade for hundreds or thousands of years. Now here are some products that contain PFAS. Some grease-resistant paper fast food containers and wrappers, microwave popcorn bags. You know how the popcorn doesn't stick to your microwave popcorn bag. That's a good thing, but it's thanks to PFAS. Pizza boxes, candy wrappers. You don't want your candy to stick to the wrapper. You can't get the candy out. That's happened to me. It's irritating. Half my candy ends up on the wrapper. I like it to slide right out. <clears throat> Non-stick cookware I mentioned, stain-resistant coatings, carpets, upholstery, other factors, water-resistant coating, cleaning products, and personal care products like shampoos, dental floss, cosmetics like nail polish and eye makeup, paints, varnishes, sealants, and firefighter turnout gear. You know, the stuff they put on before they go to the fire and firefighting foams. So are these 
helpful, useful products. Of course they are. Now, Teflon <clears throat> was introduced in 1946. And uh, the PFOA used by DuPont to make Teflon uh, and PO PFOS, these are relatives of PFAS, uh, was used by 3M Corporation to make Scotchgard. And the manufacture and importation of both of these have been, uh, of PFOS and, and P PFOA are, have been banned in the U.S., but they're still all around the world. Now, DuPont no longer makes or uses PFOA, but Keymores is a spin-off corporation of DuPont, and they make a replacement called Gen X. Um, in the United States, we don't have federal regulation of PFAS. So that means the states can regulate it if they want to. And six states now have regulated it. So six states have thought of PFAS as dangerous enough that they would like to regulate it. And um, 54, 56 states have not regulated 54 states, 44 states have not regulated My math is not good tonight. So serious drinking water contamination has been reported in China. And if you're interested in this, you can look up the article by Liu and per and polyfluoroalkyl substances, PFASs, in Chinese drinking water risk assessment and geographic distribution. It was published in the Environmental Science Europe Journal in 2021, and it's online. I downloaded it a couple of days ago, and it's online, and you can get it without difficulty. Now, some of the data from Liu, um, they obtained PFAS data from 526 drinking water samples, 66 cities in China, with almost half a billion inhabitants in these 66 cities. And in more than one, one in five of the studied cities, representing about 100 million people, uh, PFAS concentrations exceeded the level by the state of Vermont, which is one of the earlier states that banned PFAS, or regulated it, regulated PFAS. They, they can't ban PFAS because it's in the environment everywhere. They just ban the new use, and then they have environmental standards, guidelines, above which they deem a uh, public health problem. <coughs> now, human exposure PFASs uh, were estimated using total daily intakes from a document called the Exposure Factors Handbook of the Chinese Population, which has actually met estimated um, water intake, food intake, uh, from different populations all around China. It's very, actually, it's a very interesting book. Um, and uh, um, East China, which is where we are now, and the Southwest regions are at relatively higher risk of having high PFAS, which makes sense. Where is the manufacturing? Where is the consumption? Where is the population the densest? Now, some cities in the Yangtze River Basin, uh, Zijong, Zijong Jujiang, uh, Yan, Yungang, and others have exceeded European Union and U.S. health guidance. But so these, this team of Chinese scientists is trying to ring the alarm bell uh, as to PFAS concerns in your country. Now, what about human health? That's the only thing I know about. Everything else I've shown you is what my engineers have taught me. Um, so, we've learned that PFAS is associated with a variety of cancers, testicular, kidney, liver, and pancreatic, increased cholesterol, harmful effects to developing fetus and breastfeeding infants, low infant birth weights, effects on the immune system and thyroid gland, and weight gain in humans. And I was happy when, when I came to Beijing because my colleague, Dr. Professor Hu Yifei is going to be working on um, some of the childhood effects and taking a look in her Beijing pediatric cohort study. She'll be looking at, uh, at this question with one of her students. And so what, what links, th these look like very diverse health problems, don't they? But what, what 
system in the body might link them, do you think? What is the heart and cholesterol and, and infant weight and the immune system, the thyroid and te the testicles and weight gain? What do they have in common? Yeah, you could, you could say that because I'm, I'm looking for an even bigger question, which is the endocrine, the endocrine system. So we'll get to that in a minute. So what we have here is EPA health advisories are at 0 0.07 micrograms per liter. There's no maximum containment level for drinking water. It's not listed as a hazardous waste with these two big groups. Um, and different nations have different PFAS values. So. The point I'm making is we don't have a global consensus on PFAS. We don't have global guidelines that WHO has recommended. We don't have the European countries and the, American, the Americans and the Australians and the Chinese and the Indians are not all agreeing. So we're still learning. And some states are adopting more stringent endpoints now because they're more worried. So, you know, there are oldies but goodies, like ca cast iron. So cast iron, which also is pretty good at not sticking, doesn't have PFAS. Because the way they cast the iron, the steel, if you will, is such that PFASs are not necessary. And copper, if you use copper, like Revere wear, and there's a copper base, that also is not using PFAS, but it's gaining some of the same benefits of not being stick. Now, exposure routes, um, drinking contaminated water, it can be municipal, it can be well, it can even be bottled. Eating fish caught from water contaminated by PFAS or PFAS in particular, accidentally swallowing contaminated soil or dust, eating food that was packaged in materials with PFAS, and using some consumer products like nonstick cookware, stain-resistant carpeting, water repellent clothing. Now here's some good news. Only small amounts of PFAs can get through skin. Showering, bathing, washing dishes is not going to increase exposure in any substantial way. So you don't have to go around being totally paranoid. That's PFAS contamination in the United States. It's concentrated where the population density is the, is the greatest where manufacturing is the most intensive. And you can see that it's nationwide. Now, fire retardants uh, include polybromylated diphenyl ethers. And uh, these are considered persistent organic pollutants. They're not forever chemicals. They do break down. But they take a very, very long time. They're used in furniture, carpets, vehicles, electronics, and they show up in sediment, water, and air. Very easy to detect, detect them. Penta and octaforms have been phased out, but the deck is still used. And these so-called organophosphate substitutes are showing up in blood, too. Now, we think they can cause fertility problems and are linked to poor cognitive function in children. A nickname is Tris. You may have heard of Tris. And these leak, leach, leaching out of products, getting into blood by drinking, eating, touching, or inhaling, children and pets have more exposure because they have more hand-to-mouth uh, activity. Children do, and pets are on the ground all the time. Now, the concern is that these are endocrine disruptors. Endocrine disruptors. It's the endocrine system that pulls together some of those diseases I was telling you about. There may be a carcinogenicity, may cause liver, thyroid, and neurodevelopmental function and accumulates in the body. This is an interesting reference that I just found this morning. Um, it's PBDE and PFAS. So they studied the fire retardants and the uh, forever chemicals during pregnancy and maternal depression published in Environment International. And um, what they said was there was a very strong correlation between blood levels 
of the PBDE and or the PFAS with pregnancy-related depression. Now, it'll take a lot more research to prove that, but it certainly was an interesting hypothesis being generated. And that's why I'm talking about chemicals that are not forever chemicals, but they're related, so I think you should know something about them. Now, the endocrine system, as almost all of you know, uh, are the glands that produce and secrete hormones in our body, regulating growth, metabolism, sexual um, uh, development and function, and also the emotions. And the pituitary gland, the hypothalamus, the thyroid gland, parathyroid, adrenal gland, pineal, bo pineal body, or pineal body is sometimes pronounced, and reproductive glands like the ovaries and testes and the pancreas. These are, these are the endocrine system at work. So endocrine disrupting compounds is a synthetic chemical that either mimics or blocks hormones. So it can either mimic a hormone, it can resemble a hormone, or it can block a hormone. So it either can facilitate, you know, exaggeration of an endocrine signal, or it can inhibit an endocrine signal. So different PFAS compounds can do, and, and other endocrine disruptive compounds can do one or the other. And some of them are in environmental, like oak leaf trees have endocrine disruptive compounds. They're natural. But nobody lives in, a, in an oak leaf tree bed. Nobody sleeps with oak leaves scattered on their pillows. I mean, you know. None of us are exposed to oak leaves in any substantial way. Uh, decaying matter, uh, plant matter, uh, also can produce some of these. And plants with natural products called phytoestrogens. And you can read about phytoestrogens. There are a lot of plants that have phytoestrogens. And there's some funny uh, vegetables that if you eat a ridiculous... Um, like if I eat carrots all day long for the next three days, my body will turn yellow because I'm eating all these carrots. I'll, people will think I'm jaundiced. But, but um, my eyes won't turn yellow. That's the difference between jaundice from hyperkeratinemia versus jaundice, real jaundice. The, the, uh, the eyes turn yellow in jaundice, but not with eating too many carrots. That's an obscure point for medicine. Now, um, we have all of these compounds, household cleaners, personal care products, pharmaceuticals, pesticides, processed foods, plastics, industrial chemicals, animal and veterinary sources, air deposits of fire retardants. They're all on this list. So if you go to the Environmental Protection Agency of the U.S. government, there's a list of endocrine disruptors, and there are more than 12,000 chemicals. Now, most of them that you are exposed to in very low amounts are not going to overwhelm your endocrine system. But if you have a strange diet or a certain type of job and you're exposed to a lot of these, it could disrupt your endocrine system. And they have this endocrine disruptor screening program. So some products contain this statement in the U.S. If you do not use, if you're pregnant or breastfeeding, do not expose children under five years of age. That often indicates that the product contains endocrine disrupting compounds. And in California, they have a warning that is required to be put on such products that it says, this product may contain a chemical known to the state of California to cause cancer or birth defects or other reproductive harm. So. Some places are trying to alert consumers. But most consumers, I think it's fair to say, are clueless about endocrine disrupting compounds. Now, endocrine disrupting compounds are especially harmful for children. They can cause dyslipidemia, obesity, compromised renal function, and less vigorous or dysfunctional immune responses. I've read several papers about um, children who uh, have high levels 
of endocrine disrupting compounds who don't respond to vaccines as vigorously as a normal child would. And um, you can exacerbate asthma risk. Because asthma, of course, is, a, is a, an autoimmune phenomenon um, where the lungs are receiving uh, signals that sort of result in hyperconstriction. And um, if you disrupt the endocrine system, that can be exacerbated. Now, early may age amenarche. Amenarche may not be an English language word that's familiar to all of you, so that's the time when a uh, girl gets her period, starts her menses. So menarche, when I was a boy, was typically at about 13 years of age. But by the time, that was the 1950s, when by the time the 1970s came around and I was in medical school, um, menarche was more like 11 years, two years faster than when I was a kid. And by the time I reach Beijing in November of 2023, a lot of papers are coming out with menarche at 9, 10, 8. So it is a phenomenon of the late 20th century, early 21st century, that girls all around the world are having their periods at a younger age. And it is widely thought, and here's some references here. Uh, Rapazzo is in International Journal of Environmental Research and Public Health, 2017, a nice systematic review. Uh, I had a few, I, I have a few of, of this article. I brought some photocopies. I put them out front. Maybe some of you got a copy, but you can get it online. And uh, there's a um, toxicology report. So, so, you know, what is the effect of a girl having her period earlier? We don't really know. Is this harmful? Well, for one thing, she can get pregnant earlier. So if she's raped or abused or something, she can get pregnant earlier. Um, but uh, there may be psychological effects. You become a woman when you're nine years old instead of 13 or 14. So there are all sorts of potential issues here. And if and if what many of us suspect, which is that this is due to endocrine disrupting compounds, by far the best hypothesis. Nobody else has a good hypothesis of why this has happened. People say good nutrition. Well, there were plenty of people who had good nutrition in the 1940s and 1930s, had perfectly good nutrition, but they didn't have their periods at nine, they had their periods when they were 14. So anyway. Now, there are many other micro-constituents, including things like plastics, microplastics and microbeads. So plastics disintegrate into the land and into the oceans, and if they get into the oceans or the lakes or the rivers, they're ingested by aquatic organisms because they're breaking down into microplastics. And microplastics just get eaten and filtered by the fish and other creatures. So many... Um, um, personal compounds, personal use compounds, contain microbeads like exfoliates or body washes or toothpastes. If you buy a toothpaste that says special whitening ingredient, that's all, all often these microbeads. Because microbeads will not hurt your enamel. But most other most other um, products will scratch your enamel, so the dentists don't want you to use these. But microbees won't, so they're allowed. And body washes, my body wash is the best on the market. You'll be cleaner. Well, sometimes microbeads are a gentle, a gentle scrubbing action. And uh, exfoliates are, are uh, products sold specifically to take skin off. And humans who ingest seafood, like me, because I'm of Norwegian descent, so I eat a lot of seafood, um, also take in up to 11,000 tiny, tiny pieces of plastic every year just by eating our fish. 
And in the U.S., since 2017, it's been illegal to sell personal care products, PCPs, with plastic microbeads. But in the rest of the world, it's much of the rest of the world is perfectly legal. And uh, the next challenge is glitter, which are just small pieces of plastic. So glitter is used for all sorts of things. Celebrations, weddings, happy things. You have glitter. And um, you even see it in, in, in uh, cosmetics nowadays. And uh, now here's a larval perch. What's a perch? A perch is a small fish about this big, freshwater fish. It was very common in my home state of Wisconsin when I grew up as a kid. I used to go fishing. I'd, fly, I'd, I'd, I'd get perch. Very tasty. And there are perch relatives all over the world. And so this is a larval perch, the baby perch, and look at all the beads. Now those beads are not recognized by the perch's system, it, it's, it's GI system. They're not, they're not food, so they just sit there. And when the perch grows up to be a fish perch, instead of a larval player perch, then the beads are still there and maybe a lot more beads. Microplastics and microfibers. Did you know that, that microfibers are made of plastic and chemical covered non-plastics? So a lot of the products, nylon, rayon, all of these polyester products, like the stuff I'm wearing, I guess, maybe the stuff you're wearing, <clears throat> have a lot of plastics in them. I did not know this a year ago. I'm trying to educate myself about this, it was, it was mind-boggling how many plastics have an origin from our clothing. I didn't know this. So I figured if I didn't know it, maybe you didn't know it. And I could share it with you. So what happens is it break, breaks off clothes in the water when you wash it, and it's discharged through the drain water. And you never see it because it's in the washing machine. Or even if you're doing it by hand, it goes down the drain. You don't see it. They're microfibers. Now, one fleece jacket alone can shed 250,000 pieces of fiber per wash. Here's a tangle of microfibers that were filtered from drain water. Standard load of laundry. The human hair is about 70 microns. The naked eye can see about half of a human hair. A, blood, a red blood cell is about 8 microns. And microfibers vary between 3 and 60 microns. So only a fraction of them are visible. Most of them are invisible. Another category, bisphenol A or BPA, are used in clear, hard plastics. Polycarbonate plastic and epoxy resins since the 1950s. They have weak hormone-like properties, so they're also potential endocrine disruptors. Some, some U.S. states have laws to prohibit BPA from being used in baby bo bo bottles and products because we don't know what effect it'll have in babies, so why are we using plastic baby bottles? We should be using glass baby bottles. Or breast milk is even better. And many manufacturers have made substitutions, so a lot of manufacturers are changing their product line to make sure there's no BPA. Now, removal is difficult. Replacement products have to either be cor corrosion resistant with stand high temperatures, used for sterilization processing, be chemically compatible with foods, not add an odor or taste, which was the big advantage of the BPAs. So reducing exposure by using glass baby bottles, stainless water bottles, food products not in cans rather than plastic. I have tried to stop drinking from plastic, just as a habit. So in the, in the hotel, I take uh, my uh, tea, um, uh, kettle and I boil the water and then I pour it into my glasses and I drink that instead. Now I'm not protecting myself from PFAS because that might come from, the, from this water or that water but there are plenty of things that I am protecting myself from by not, not um, drinking um, or eating from plastic goods. But let me tell you it's almost impossible. It's very, very difficult 
to avoid plastic. But I do, I do it whenever I can, <laughs> which, you know, still is a small, small thing. Phthalates. Phthalates we call the everywhere chemical. Not the forever chemical, but the everywhere chemical. Because they're in so many different products. They don't last as long as PFAS, thank God. They're in soft plastic toys. They're in vinyl flooring and wall covering. New car smell is a phthalate smell. Detergents, lubricating oils, food packaging, pharmaceuticals, blood bags, and tubing in the hospitals. And about 75% of personal care products, cosmetics, fragrances, nail polish, hairsprays, soap, shampoos, have these phthalates. Now, what about a phthalate? Why are we concerned? Well, it's still that endocrine um, disruptor function that we're concerned about. Now, many manufacturers in the U.S. and Europe are taking phthalates out of products because customers have complained. Do I have to have these phthalates in the product? How critical are they? Um, they're so ubiquitous. So Avon, Johnson & Johnson, Revlon, even Disney. They make a lot of toys, Disney. And if you want to check if phthalates are in products, you can go to this website, ewg.org, Skin Deep. And there's a phthalates action plan summary from the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency they did about 11 years ago. You can read about that. And um, the Department of uh, Environmental Health Policy is, is testing for public uh, water supplies and regulating under the Safe Drinking Water Act in the United States. Pharmaceuticals, another list of chemicals that get into the environment at high rates. People throw away drugs that they haven't used into the sink or toilet, and public sewer systems and septic systems end up at wastewater treatment plants, don't they? People throw the drugs into the trash, and these medications, uh, those medications that are applied externally um, uh, uh, are, are discharged during um, showering, bathing, and hand washing. So I had a little rash from my jogging, and I used, uh, used a hydrocortisone cream. So that's fine. And then my rash went away. But where did the hydrocortisone product go? When I took a bath or shower, it went into the water. And if I washed my clothes, it went into the water. So, you know, use your imagination. Now, here's a real shocker. The, the, if any of you are physicians, you may be aware of this, but most of you who are not physicians probably don't know this. But we only metabolize a fraction of the drugs that we put in our body. Sometimes the bioavailability is very high and will metabolize 90% of the product, and we only excrete 10% of it. Sometimes the bioavailability is not very high, and we it's the other way around. We only metabolize 10% of it, and we excrete 90% of it. Just, just a, a little aside, um, would any of you care to guess anesthetic gases that we then inhale to be put to sleep for surgery? How, met, m how much of that gas is metabolized by our body and puts us to sleep, and how much of it is 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 exhaled anybody want to guess is it is it 95 percent of it's used is 50 percent of it used is five percent of it used five percent is used 95 percent we simply blow out again and interestingly um anesthetic gases some of them are potent greenhouse gas gases so enlightened Anesthesiologists and environmentalists have worked with industry now for gas recapture systems. So instead of venting these gases, they're now being reharvested and processed so they don't end up in the environment contributing to global warming. That was not anything to do with this talk, but it's sort of an analogous issue. Now, how do we reduce pharmaceuticals in the environment? We have to educate the public to dispose of medications properly. That's how we do reduce it. 
because in the U.S. we have drug take-back events that are announced and, and people can dispose, or, uh, dispose uh, in an authorized collection box at a pharmacy or at these drug take-back events. And um, collected drugs are ultimately incinerated, which is a way to just get rid of them in the environment. And uh, trash notifications to remind people not to throw away their pharmaceuticals in the trash are often written in English, Spanish, and Chinese in the U.S., the three most common languages. And if possible, you can reduce the amount that you ingest, medications and uh, nutraceuticals or dietary supplements. Only take the medications that are appropriate. Don't take medications longer than you need to and have your doctor review the medications and supplements that you take. I have friends who take dietary supplements every day that they don't need. They have a balanced diet. They don't need supplements. Women might need iron if they're menstruating. They might need vitamin D. But otherwise, most people don't need anything. A balanced diet, you don't need to take these things. On the other hand, very large industries are trying to sell a lot of products and all this stuff ends up in the environment one way or the other. And uh, what do we contribute from pharmaceut ph pharmaceuticals, I spelled it wrong, and personal care products? In, in, way back uh, 15 years ago, the average person in the U.S. used nine a day. The most recent number is 15. So that's 15 pharmaceuticals or personal care products per person per day, which includes drugs, supplements, Lotions, soaps, gels, powders, clones, sprays, toothpaste, makeup, medications. So think about every product or medication you use this week. And it's a lot. I, I, I did it as an exercise the other day, and I got up to 14. And I'm not a big consumer, really, and I usually don't use makeup. That's a joke. So um, remember, everything goes somewhere. Do you need to use all these things? Can you substitute something less toxic to the environment? And especially, can you reduce antibacterials that you use? We don't like people taking antibiotics when they're not necessary. We don't like people using antibacterial creams when they're not necessary because it introduces antibiotics into the environment, which can stimulate drug-resistant mutations in bacteria and selection. So microconstituents are everywhere. All municipal sewage in the world contains microconstituents. Different geographic areas will differ with respect to the types, quantities, and relative abundance, of course. Microconstituents can be transported by water, food, touch, and air. They, can be they are found in all tested waterways and are found in drinking water, both tapped and bottled. Present of a, presence of a microconstituent doesn't necessarily mean it's harmful. And that's why we have an environmental health sciences department at the Yale School of Public Health. That's why the U.S. has an environmental protection agency. That's why China has its environmental protection administration, because we need groups like this to do and interpret needed research to try to find out what's dangerous, what's not. Because it's unrealistic to say, I want to get rid of micro, micro uh, constituents. It's not possible. So we have to figure out which ones are dangerous and try to get rid of those. Now, I want to end, well, pl plastic recycling, by the way. Um, threes and sevens are the worst products. So if you can avoid buying things that have threes and sevens on them, you'll do well. This is a universal code. It's being used all over the world. You'll see it on Chinese products, American products, European products, African products. Um, the easiest to recycle are ones, twos, and fives. So one, two, five, good. Three, seven, not good. And if it's if it's black plastic, you just throw it away because it's 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 got recycled electronic waste and it's not going to be recycled again. Now here's a positive slide. Finally, so at your level, personal family. We can try to reduce unnecessary consumption and unnecessary waste. We can avoid all forever chemicals. We really need to get PFAS out of our society because we now know that they can cause disease and we now know that they're around forever. 
virtually forever. We need to properly dispose pharmaceuticals, spelled correctly. We need pollution prevention cleanup, including correct recycling. And we have to take political action to insist on safe drinking water. Safe drinking water, I believe, is responsibility of our government because we cannot guarantee safe drinking water. I don't control the reservoirs and aquifers and the sources of water for the Beijing or the New York City water supply. The government does that for me. I, I, I elect officials to protect me. It's part of their function. So we need to exert political action. Now, government and industry are not off the hook. They are responsible for regulation and enforcement and uh, adherence. And they can have regulations and enforce themselves if they are responsible. Pollution prevention and cleanup, upgrading wastewater treatment plants because wastewater treatment plants need advanced treatment processes to process a lot of these chemicals. And they can process a lot of the chemicals, but they need advanced processes, which the older plants don't have. Placement and use of landfills. There are places that are better to put a landfill and places that are worse. Some landfills are put in places that are disastrous because the landfill just leaches right into a stream. And green chemistry, oops. Green chemistry, what is green chemistry? That is the design of chemical products and processes that reduce or eliminate the use or generation of hazardous substances. So green chemistry, the, the so-called father of green chemistry is a man named Paul Anastas. He won the Volvo Prize in Environmental Health Sciences about two years ago, three years ago, and that's considered the Nobel Prize for Environmental Science. And I'm proud to say he's a member of our faculty. He's at Yale School of Public Health and has a uh, a joint appointment with the Yale School of Environment. And um, I learned a lot about these issues from Paul and readings that he guided me to when I was dean. So what happens is you've got a product chemical that helps you uh, with um, lubrication of equipment in a factory. And eventually, that chemical ends up in the environment, either because it's, it's, it's um, being um, used and then it dribbles onto the floor and it's cleaned up, or somebody cleans the machine and it's cleaned up, or it gets aerated. And it might be very toxic, toxic to humans, toxic to animals, toxic to plants, whatever. But if a green chemist gets a hold of this and works on it, they may be able to develop a product that retains the qualities needed for lubrication, but substantially diminishes the toxicity. That is green chemistry. And that is a very noble profession because nobody expects us to get rid of chemicals. Chemicals are here. I mean, we, we, don't, we don't live our lifestyles without chemicals. But if we can reduce the toxicity of the chemicals we use, that's a win-win situation. So the field of green chemistry uh, takes these compounds and, and changes or manipulates them in experimental ways. Sometimes you can, you can do computer modeling and use AI to estimate whether taking the fluorine off and putting something else you know, on you know, putting in a hydroxy group on, will that change the quality that's favorable in the chemistry and will that reduce the toxicity? A big part of toxicity is persistence in the environment and you can sometimes put a, uh, put a chemical moiety that um, if the compound encounters water or encounters some other substance, it will cause it to break in half. But in the, in the use of the product, it, it, it retains its strength because it's not in contact with water. Stuff like that. Clever, creative, um, chemical strategies. And that's, that's just our school's uh, logo and in front of the school. And when we were working hard on COVID, somebody put a little thank you heart. So I like that one.
and uh, Shay Shay, thank you for your tip.